Okay, we're in Jeremiah 44, the warning of God's judgment. If you remember the remnant who fled from the massacre at Mitzvah, who, was, who were taken by Ishmael going to Ammon. They were overtaken by Johanan, who killed Ishmael and took that remnant and took them towards Egypt. Now they are in Egypt. Um, and it's really an interesting sequence. I just really think this says a lot about the nature, the sin nature of human beings and the mysterious nature of our rebellion against God. These people had asked Jeremiah for God's opinion. Should they go to Egypt or not? Um, and Jeremiah prayed for 10 days and came back and said, God says, no, don't go to Egypt. Well, that's not the answer these people want to hear, wanted to hear. So we're going to go anyway. It's some kind of conspiracy. Jeremiah, you're saying that because Baruch, Baruch, your scribe, told you to say that. Um, I think we get a little bit more of the story here. We get a little bit deeper look. We peel a layer back and look underneath at some of the motivation uh, for these people and the crooked way that people think about God. It, is, it just comes to me all the time, that verse where Paul says, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are saved, it's the power of God. There is something about faith. We know the Holy Spirit illuminates faith for those that believe, illuminates teaching. When we read the Bible, we see something deeper than a person that has not given their heart to God. And, and it is really interesting, the turn of events here, as this story unfolds about these people going to Egypt. In verse 1, the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews who dwell in the land of Egypt, who dwell in Migdal. Migdal means fortress in Hebrew. So they lived in a fortress at Taf Tahophanes. And so these are in the same region. We'll look at a map uh, and generally, it is listed, Migdal and Tahapanes are listed together, so probably there is a fortress in either at Tahapanes or close by there, at Nof, which I could not find on a map, and in the country of Pathros. Now, Pathros, I think, means to the south, the region to the south, or it is a region down south of this other region, um, and so we'll look at the map after this in the next slide. Verse 2 says, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, you have seen all the calamity I've brought on Jerusalem. So going back, this is several years after Jerusalem fell. These people lived in and around Jerusalem uh, probably four or five years or more. It could at this point, time is getting a little bit uh, odd here. Uh, could be more than five years later. You saw all that. You remember that, all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day, they are a desolation. So Judah was laid waste. And that was really the difference between the 586 deportation and the one in 10, 11 years earlier in 597. 597, they laid siege to the city. They finally got in. They looted the temple. But they left everything in place in the city of Jerusalem, including the temple. 586, when they breached the wall and tore things down, they began tearing the walls down. Uh, they tore the temple down. They drug the stones, the massive stones to rebuild it. They drug them away. And they left a desolation. No one dwells in them to this day. So there is a map. Jeremiah's work in Egypt extends beyond Tapanes, and I don't know, it's a little bit hard to see, but you see over here the delta of Egypt, up there is Jericho and Jerusalem, they made their way along the coast into that northern region, and that's called Tapanes and Mig Migdal, beyond Tapanes to Migdal, and so I couldn't pinpoint point Migdal, but again, it, it, the word means fortress in Hebrew. Noth, I could not find on any map. Uh, Beth Shemesh, we talked about last week, that's probably Hierapolis. 
uh, the city of the sun. Bath means house. Shemesh means sun, house of the sun. So that's probably Hierapolis. And then Myth, Memphis down there, down the down the Nile River to Memphis is probably in the region of Pathros. Uh, so reasons, uh, God gives reasons for judgment. Because of their wickedness, this is the people of Jerusalem, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went, okay, this is both, this is talking back about Jerusalem and Judah, but it's also talking about the current people. Uh, but in Jerusalem, they provoked me to anger in that they went to burn incense and serve other gods whom they did not know, they, they nor their fathers. These are picking up the habits of a culture. You know, relig they were much more religious people then, and... If you wanted to fit in, if you wanted to impress people, if you wanted to be liked, you would embrace people's gods. It's, it's really not very different at all from the stuff people do today, to fit in and be liked, the way we dress, the things we say. Um, these are not gods that they had relationship with. These are not gods that had taken them by the hand, the Bible would say, taken you by the hand and led you like a mother would lead a child out of slavery in Egypt. However, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Hosea, rising early and sending them. Rising early and sending them means I have worked and worked and worked to let you know the truth. I have told you. Turn from your wicked ways. Don't worry so much about religious correction, but give your heart to God. Turn from your evil ways and obey God. Seek to please God in the choices you make. Saying, oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. Do not burn incense, you know, every day in your house before you, as a sacrifice to, the, to your idol. So, you know the scriptures that says, where God says, I will, when you do the sacrifice and you will burn the fat and you'll burn the, the carcass of the sacrificial animal on the brazen altar and the smoke will come to me in heaven and it will be a pleasing, a pleasing offering. That's very much an ancient cosmology. That, that's the way that ancient people thought about the gods. And so God was using language that he understood sacrifice is a pleasing aroma to me and that is that is we would say metaphorical language what people one of the ways that people worshiped a god was to have an idol representation of it and they would burn pleasing smelling incense perfume and things like that they would bathe their statue they would say they would get a bowl of whatever their richest food was, and they would set it beside the idol. They would, after washing the idol carefully, they would lay it down in a bed at night. And this was the people serving their God. The sacrifices in that world, in that religious world, sacrifices were different for the pagans than they were for the Israelites. The Israelites took sacrifice as a worship form and adapted it to Yahweh. In the pagan in the pagan worship style, they were killing that animal and, and giving it as a meal to the gods. They fed the gods by doing sacrifices. Well, we know in the Hebrew worship of Yahweh, they were not feeding God. God said in places, I don't need your offerings. I'm not hungry. It is the... Sacrifice is pleasing to me. And they did a whole thing with the life being in the blood. They transferred, it was about transferring their sin onto a substitute. The life is in the blood. Someone had to give their life blood to pay for their sin. And that animal gave its life blood to take care of the sin that was transferred on. So it was the same form of worship 
that other people did, but it had a, a whole new meaning with a living God, okay? And so burning incense was a form of the way that pagan people worshipped, and so they would burn incense to these pagan gods. Now, it talks a little bit here in a minute about the Queen of Heaven, and we've seen it in everything we've studied in the Old Testament. The Queen of Heaven is a fertility god. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to those verses. Uh, but again, that sexual element comes in. Just like in our culture, sexual things are very attractive to people. People are drawn. And, you know, God has always battled sexuality as something that takes people's attention away from him uh, in our culture. It's not a new thing. Same thing in the ancient world. Uh, the people that worshipped the fertility gods and goddesses uh, indulged in sexual, we would say, libertinism, you know, doing, doing whatever made them feel good sexually in order to honor the fertility gods. And that's an element in the background here when we talk about the queen of heaven. But, oh, do not do this abominable thing that I, the living God, the creator, that I hate. Uh, they were very consistent. These people, and I think that's the reason we're going back in it. You know, for the first 25 chapters of Je Jeremiah, he said the same thing, didn't he? You've turned your back on me. You've turned to pagan gods. Punishment is coming. Judgment day is coming for you. Then we had a big section in the middle. There, there was a promise of a new covenant. Then we had the downfall, the final judgment coming upon Judah. Now we see this remnant that survived the Holocaust running in disobedience away from Egypt. And they are re-embracing as they run away. They're re-embracing these um, pagan practices. They're very consistent in their rebellion. But they did not listen or incline their ear and turn from their wickedness. I think he's still here talking about before in Judah, before the 586 deportation. To burn, let's see, they did not turn from their wickedness to burn no incense to other gods. So my fury, my anger were poured out and kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as it is this day. Look at Jerusalem. I sent my prophets. They warned you. Look at Jerusalem. Was I good for my word? You know, the priest of the king, the prophets that stood in the king's court that were not of God said, no, 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 God would never trouble his city. God would never. This is the, God has put his name on Jerusalem and he would never let this happen. Jeremiah, for, as for one, was telling you, no, if you do not turn in faith to God, I'm going to lay waste to Jerusalem. Now look at Jerusalem. Who was telling the truth? That's what we're getting right here. So my fury and anger were poured out and kindled. They are wasted and desolate as it is this day. Why do you do it? God is asking. Now, therefore, says the Lord, God of hosts, God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? and cut off from you man and woman, child, infant, out of Judah, leaving none to remain. Why are you running to Egypt in disobedience? Why are you turning to other gods? What do I have to do to get through to you? And so it keeps coming back to this idea of the land. The Jewish people have a very geographical relationship with the land and God. Have you ever noticed that? In your lifetime, you've seen a lot of geographical importance to the land of Israel. And they return. Even these secular Jews, which are just like in days of old with the Jews, just like in Bible times, most of the Jews don't believe in God. And those that believe, a big proportion of them, do not uh, seek him in faith. But are they still Jewish? 
Yes. Are they still drawn to that land? Yes. I mean, in a way that we can't even understand. So when you hear the land, Haaretz, they call it. That's the Hebrew. There's a newspaper called Haaretz in, in Jerusalem. Um, they feel a bond to that land. What does that mean? What is that bond? Well, if we understand the Bible, that is the place of relationship with God for this people. It is the Garden of Eden. And it is very interesting to me, fascinating as a, uh, a student of the Old Testament, that in the Garden of Eden, they were there and everything was free and relationship with God was easy. And they walked with God and there was no fear. There was no shame. There was no crime, pain, weeping, tiredness, uh, humidity, flies, nothing. Nothing that causes us aggravation. And they rebelled. They listened to a suggestion of the devil. And they rebelled. And were cast out. And there was a there was a an angel guarding the back door, the east gate of the garden. There's a lot of hints when we get to Joshua after the Egyptian captivity. And don't lose sight of that in, Jer in Jeremiah here, that they are fleeing back to the place that held them captive, to the bondage. We are in bondage. People that are lost are in bondage to sin. And even when people have been saved and go, go into, back into relationship with God, there is an attraction back to their sin. And the more sinful a person is, the harder it is, is to clean up the rest of their life. Being raised in church does not guarantee anybody's faith. We know that. But I'll tell you what, it does make for cleaner habits. If you've been raised in church, you don't have as much to repent of when you get to when you come to the to to the altar and pray and get baptized. And then once you are a Christian, you don't have as many whispers in your ear calling you back to your old way of life. It's a lot easier to grow up in church. And that's the problem with our society. We know people, the Bible Belt and people feeling like they ought to go to church does not save more people than just living in a pagan society. It doesn't save more people. But what it does is it makes people more decent. It makes our society better for people to go to church. All right? I'll say it again, in my opinion, the percentage of people that get born again is no higher in a good Bible belt than it is anywhere else. The difference is that is a much more pleasant society to live in. If you don't believe me, get in your car and drive to New Orleans. That is a pagan society. And you drive down there and you walk around a little bit and tell me you don't feel a difference in the spiritual like, and there's wickedness down there. They, they celebrate wickedness. Now, I thought it was a wicked place 25 years ago when I lived there. I bet it wouldn't feel quite as wicked now to me. I bet it would be a lot more similar to Burke County now. And so it makes a difference. When people stop going to church, oh, holy cow, it makes a difference in the society. But it, I don't know if it does much for salvation. Anyway. The Jews have this very geographical, that was a tangent. Jews have a very geographical relationship with the land. That land represents the place that we walk with God. When we got to Joshua, it is very interesting. A lot of clues in the beginning of Joshua that this is a return to the Garden of Eden. That they're going back. Just a lot of little things to say you're going back to the Garden of Eden. But do they walk right in and say, we're back, God. We're back in relationship. No, they have to fight. And that's what sin, how sin has changed the world. You don't just walk back into relationship with God. We, we sometimes, because we want people to come to faith in God, we make faith sound awful peachy. Walk 
down the aisle, I'll get you a job eating chocolate cake. That don't happen, does it? It's hard following God. You have to fight daily. And you have to fight sin nature's habits. And you have to fight temptation. And you have to fight. Sometimes you have to argue and fight for the faith. So what he's saying here is, why do you commit the great evil against yourself? To cut you off uh, from you, you man and woman, child and infant, out of Judah, leaving none to remain, cutting off your relationship with the land. In other words, staying out of fellowship with God. And you are running back to Egypt We've been there before. That's slavery and bondage to your sins. You provoke me to wrath, God says in verse 8, in that you provoke me to wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense to other gods in the land of Egypt, where you have gone to dwell. They go down here, people are pagan. They're worshiping pagan gods, polytheistic. Uh, and the people immediately pick up their, those habits that you may cut yourselves off and be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Look at that last phrase. How have the Jewish people been treated in the world as they left the land? Have they been warmly accepted everywhere they've gone? I think America is one of the best places they've ever gone. I think America has been, as things go, has been pretty receptive to Jews. But most of the places they've gone, they've had a hard time. Hey, I've been reading about World War I, and a lot of Jews went to Russia. We know the fiddler on the roof. And that is World War I, and the Jews are being moved out. Genocide, we would call that. And it was interesting, in World War I, as the Russians went to the front to fight uh, Austria-Hungary and to fight Germany, when they would go through regions that were Jewish, they would, these are Russian citizens, they would just exterminate them. They would just kill the Jews. And so, is God telling the truth here? You've cut yourself off from the land, relationship, your identity with God, you're out there on your own. You will be a curse and a reproach among all the nations on earth. God is alive and well. And the Bible is telling the truth. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers? The wickedness of the kings of Judah? The wickedness of their wives? Your own wickedness? And the wickedness of your wives which they committed in the land of Judah in these streets of Jerusalem? So, not only are you burning incense here in, in Egypt with the pagan practices, fitting in among the Egyptians, you were doing it when you were in Judah. You know, however many years, five, when you, when you were, we were calling for revival among the people to turn to God because Nebuchadnezzar was laying siege, you would go to your house and burning a little incense to an idol. In spiritual matters, people rarely change. Is that true? I think the only actual change, I mean, we make some surface changes and we change from children to adults, but I think the only dramatic changes that people make are spiritual level changes. We can lose weight I can lose weight, I still want to eat more than is healthy for me to eat. Um, it, just as one example, the only true changes that people make are spiritual changes. And then, if we are disciplined, our spiritual changes will be reflected in the way we do things in our life. But it's a very slow process. We know that. And we know that. That's why... Uh, um, sanctification, being more holy people, is such a hard, slow process. It just takes years and years and years to see difference. But I'll tell you what, 
I can't see that much difference between now and 15 months ago in my life. But I can go back 15 years, I can go back 30 years, and I can see things that used to be stumbling blocks for me are not anymore. And so those are spiritual changes, and they take a long time. So let's look at what it says about this. They have not been humbled. The people that burned incense in the streets of Jerusalem, when they saw Nebuchadnezzar break in, take away most of the Jews, tear the walls down, flee in terror, escape, go to Mitzvah, get dragged away by Ishmael, get dragged away by Johanan. They have not been humbled. To this day, nor have they feared God. Even though he told them through the prophets, this is what I'm going to do, and it's exactly what has happened, they have not feared him. It's like I said Sunday. If you are not bothered by your own sin, then you're not saved. Now, we got to walk a fine line. Some people can get over bothered, so bothered by their sin that they lose function and they have no joy in their salvation. And all they do is worry about how sinful they are. That's the devil talking to you. There is a middle road we have to find. Always humble, always a little bit distrustful of ourselves so that we do not put ourselves in a situation that's going to cause us to trip up. Listen, I, if I want to stay on my diet, I cannot, I cannot, you know, take my computer into to the pastry store or sit in Burger King and type my sermon and expect to not eat. You know, you've got to be humble. You've got to take yourself out of situations that cause you to stumble. At the same time, I can't live in fear of going to Burger King. You know, I just have to be careful about it. They have not walked in my law or in my statutes that I set before you and your fathers. Spiritual change. Let's look at some verses from the New Testament on spiritual change. Just the nature of spiritual change. This, this means... This is Paul writing to the Corinthians. Probably the second Corinthians five was one of the first letters that he sent to the Corinthians. It's funny how where they positioned it in the book. Second Corinthians is probably several different letters that have been put together. I don't know that exactly, but that that is the suspicion of scholars. And probably when he refers in first Corinthians to the letter that he had already sent them. It's probably this initial part of 2 Corinthians. Anyway, he said, This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That is spiritual. They still look the same. They still have the same habits of the flesh that they did. But they become a new person. Spiritually, the old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift of God who brought us back to himself through Christ. Notice that. Brought us back to himself. Where did we start? Where did humans start? In the Garden of Eden. And we fled. We rebelled and fled. And so salvation is bringing us back to God. Bringing us back to himself through Christ. God has given us this task of reconciling, putting their other people to him. That's what we were talking about Sunday. As we go in the world, uh, we are to be a witness. We are to make disciples. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal to mankind through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. That is spiritual change. That's not human wisdom. Also in 2 Corinthians, a little bit earlier. That's why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are renewed every day. Paul might be looking, as he writes that, he might be looking at Lamentations 3. There's every good chance 
for our present troubles are small and they won't last very long when you look at eternity, when you're taking an eternal view, when you're viewing things as God views things. Yet they produce for us these trials, these aggravations that came after the garden. They produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them. Our troubles, when we cling to God and feel bad and face trouble and shame and those things and still cling to God, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs the pain, the difficulty. And that glory will last forever. Does anybody here remember a bad day a year ago? How bad they felt? You might. I mean, depending on how significant it is. But mostly we don't. We've had a thousand bad days. And we forgot about them. Glory will go on forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can now see. This is spiritual change. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen, on the spiritual. We, our context is a spiritual, uh, is a, the spirit God creating all the physical stuff, and we walk through the physical stuff, but our context is God the creator. And and we as we go through the day in the physical world, we are trying to seek God's purposes and putting things and people in our life, and we're trying to live into that purpose. That's a whole different way of looking at reality that's different than getting up there and pushing an old person out of the way to get some produce at the thing, isn't it? When you're looking at it from God's view, so we don't look at troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that can't be seen for the things we can see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Spiritual change. One more. In Ephesians, Paul wrote the Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, throw off your old sinful nature. Now, we are born with a sin nature. We are drawn to sin inherently. It's, we inherited, according to Paul in Romans, we inherited the sin of Adam uh, that is passed genetically. Uh, in the genome project, they'll probably find a sin gene. I don't know. But it's been passed down, and so we're born into sin. This is a thing that I haven't got 100% clarification on, a theological question. I, but I believe my current understanding is when we get born again, our sin nature is replaced by the righteousness of Christ. That is spiritual. So our soul becomes the righteousness of Christ. However, our soul exists where? Inside this flesh. And so the flesh, I tend to define flesh as my physical body, what I think, and what I feel. So my soul is the righteousness of Christ, and I don't have a sin nature anymore. However, my brain, my emotions, and my body have habits, 57 years habits of sin. So we have a tendency to sin, but we do not have a sin nature anymore that drives us to sin. We are just getting back in line. We are, we are paying rent to a landlord that we no longer live at his house when we sin. Does that sound square, Faye? Um, so I don't think we have sin nature anymore. Would you agree with that? We have sin habits. We all have a sin nature. I think we're born with it, we, and we don't want to. We don't want to get too deep in this rabbit trail, do we? But I think when we are saved, our sin nature is taken away and replaced with the righteousness of Christ. However, our flesh still has sin habits, and so maybe we're playing. Maybe I'm playing a word game there. We still sin. There's no question. But but Paul says we're no longer have to sin. But when we sin. 
we are making a choice to sin and we know that we are responsible and we have shamed God who died for us. Um, and so that's why I always say we still sin. We're no better than anybody. And, and the reason that's important is can you take the sin nature with you into eternity? Will we be able to take that sin nature and go into heaven with it? No. When do we lose it? I say at the moment of salvation. And, and as I say, I, I, I can't you know, pull scripture, A, B, C, D, to make a case, but it's in there. I believe we lose our sin nature. I believe before salvation, we, we, we pretty much can't say no to sin. At, at once we are saved, we, the sin nature is taken away, and we are imparted with the righteousness of Christ. And at that point, we become super responsible for our own sin, and that's why we feel bad when we sin. Anyway, technical point. We don't want to go. I think that's what this is talking about. Throw off your old sin nature and your former way of life. And see, I think those are two different things that it's talking about. I think there's separation the sin nature is our inability to not sin that we inherited from Adam. And the former way of things is what we did because of that sin nature. I think we still have the former way of life sticking to us. You know, I, I try not to eat chocolate cake every day, but I remember what it tastes like. And when I see a chocolate cake, it looks awful good to me. And I will impose will to say, I'm not going to eat that every day. I'm going to save that for my birthday or whatever. Uh, and so I think that former way of life is what I'm talking about. Is Our flesh has a habit of sin that we quickly jump to. But I believe the old sin nature is gone. Uh, the former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes takes a long time. That's not a snap my finger and the, the old lust are gone. Put on your new nature. Actively, intentionally work at putting on a new nature, which is Christ created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Back to Jeremiah. And now, connecting the writings of Paul there about the Christian nature, the spiritual change. Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah in 31 said, I'm going to make a new covenant uh, where I will be your God and you will be my people. Uh, you will write scripture on your heart and you will desire to do good. And I think, so I think Jeremiah is very important in understanding this new nature. God says, I will, to the remnant who is in Egypt, I will set my face against you Okay, we're about out of time here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for catastrophe and for cutting off all Judah. Again, this is very repetitive, and this is to show us the stubbornness of the human heart. I think we are looking in the book of Jeremiah. We see 25 chapters of warning, 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 warning. Then judgment comes. And these are the people left after the judgment who have fled again to God and are going back to Egypt, again, cutting themselves off from the land, walking away from relationship with God. Uh, the great lie of, to human beings is that we are in control. Most people that, for example, came to John Rocket's funeral, I would say 99% of those people, as we talked about spiritual things and we talked about God, 99% of the people said, yeah, you know, I kind of think God exists. I think that's a good thing. I want that kind of faith that John had someday. I want that someday. That's a good goal, somewhere down the line. That is a great lie, isn't it? Because who is guaranteed to make it to down the line? 
the great lies that we're in control and we can call on God when we decide to. These Jews disobeyed God with intention. I'm not sure where I, I dropped my sentence off there. Uh, they willfully, they called on, that's what I'm thinking about in that statement there was them asking Jeremiah for God's will. And when he gave it, and it was the opposite of what they wanted to do, they said, we got no time for that. I tend to think these people, because they asked for God's will, at some point intend to get back to God. Does that make sense? And you will fall with that intention. I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their face to go to the land of Egypt and dwell there, and they shall be consumed and they shall fall in the land of of Egypt. Ultimately, I've said this before, the Bible is about justice. What people most want in this life, what they want the most in this life, they will share its fate in eternity. And for the created things that are going to be destroyed at Judgment Day, they will be destroyed along with them with, with fire. Um, they shall be consumed, they shall fall in the land of Egypt, they shall be consumed by sword and famine, they shall die from the least to the greatest, they shall be an oath, an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. This new cross-section of Jews, so I say that as compared to those that were in Jerusalem and Judah before Nebuchadnezzar, that's a new cross-section, but it's the same old rebellion and the same old consequences. I think that's what the book of Jeremiah is trying to get us to see. The stubbornness of the human heart, the willfulness, the, the absolute determinism that people have to do what they want to do, and if God doesn't like it, he can step off. He can just back up. I will punish those in Egypt, for I will punish those who dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword and famine and pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah who have gone to Egypt to dwell there shall escape or survive, lest they return to Judah to which they desire. For none shall return except those who escape. Now notice, none shall, and then he puts a little phrase right at the end of that phrase, except those who escape. And so what we see God saying you have condemned yourself with your choice to flee. But then he leaves a tiny window open because people do turn and we never know when and we never know who are going to turn to God in faith. The decision to turn away from God is usually an eternal decision. People say, I'm not ready now to accept Christ most likely never will. The fine attitude confirms their sin when all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods with all the women who were standing by, a great multitude of people, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros answered Jeremiah saying, they give open defiance here, as for the word that you have spoken to us, talking to Jeremiah, in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. And you will fail. But, but we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth. We'll do what we want to, Jeremiah and God, to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we've done. We and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the city of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of food. We were well off and we saw no trouble. They were parting as Nebuchadnezzar was coming. They were parting as Jer Jeremiah said, you need to turn to God. And now they said, well, that was the good life. What we did then, that was the good life. So this is an emphatic lesson about most people don't change. 
The rationale offered is very pragmatic. When these people engaged in worship of the Queen of Heaven in Judah before, there was plenty of food. Life was untroubled. In their view, it was when the worship of the Queen of Heaven was interrupted that trouble came to Judah. When they were called to turn back to Yahweh, there could hardly be a clearer challenge to the ultimate sovereignty of Yahweh than this response. I think we're getting to the... the, crux of the matter here with human beings. Just talking a little bit about the Queen of Heaven, known by different names. Now this is not, there's not an absolute link. This is somebody, a a certain amount of speculation, but it, uh, um, Asarte, Ishtar, these are fertility goddesses. The Easter is the name in English. Estre is Anglo-Saxon. That Easter comes from the Anglo-Saxon in English. Ishtar was the Babylonian fertility goddess. Ashtaroth was the Hebrew name for this fertility goddess. And Asarte is the Greek. And so Asarte was a Phoenician and Greek uh, fertility goddess. Ashtaroth was the Canaanite fertility goddess that married Baal. Uh, Ishtar was the Babylonian fertility goddess. And and that carried into Anglo-Saxon as a fertility goddess. They were Anglo-Saxons were pagans before the church came there. Our downfall was trusting God, these people say. But since we stopped burning incense to the Queen of Heaven and we pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything we've been, and we have been consumed by the sword and famine. So their answer to the to Jeremiah was that. When we stopped pulling for the Queen of Heaven, that's when our trouble began. When we turned away from paganism, we lost everything. In other words, a good God will give us exactly what we want when we want it. Were they correct? Well, here's what Hosea had said. Hosea goes all the way back 150 years prior to where the northern kingdom was there. Talking about uh, Gomer, Hosea said his children's mother had played the harlot, saying, I will go after my lovers, who will give me my bread and my water, my wool, flax, my oil and drink. I will hedge hedge up her way with thorns and build a wall against her. This is God saying, I will correct and, and judge Hosea. So she cannot find her paths of paganism. She will pursue her lovers but she will not overtake them. Thus I, Yahweh, will take back my grain, my new wine, because in the end I was the one giving these things to her. I will also take away my wool and my flax, given to cover her nakedness. Um, And so Prophet Hosea was saying it wasn't the Queen of Heaven that was giving those things. It was Yahweh. And it was judgment against them. Amos, um, God said to Amos, I withheld the rain from you, talking to Israel, so cities would stagger to one another city, to another city to drink water, yet you've not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew and caterpillar devouring, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent plague among you and slew your young men, yet you have not returned to me. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, yet you have not returned to me. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you these punishments for real because your heart is hard. And it wasn't just the women. The women said... When we burned incense to Queen of Heaven, poured out drink offerings to her, it, did we make cakes for her to worship and pour out the drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? In other words, it wasn't just the women. Our men participated in these fertility rituals also. Um. It wasn't just the women.
Then Jeremiah spoke to all the people, men, women, and all the people who had given him that answer, saying, The incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem and your fathers and the kings and princes and the people of the land, did not Yahweh remember them and did not did it not come into his hand? Jeremiah reminds that God is always aware when we turn our hearts to other gods. There's ne we cannot sneak in a, in a room and, and turn our heart from God. So, so Yahweh could no longer bear it because of your evil doings of abomination which you committed. Thus your land is a desolation, astonishment, a curse, without an inhabitant as it is this day. So again, even seeing God's judgment, these people refused to turn. And this is the very reason that God judged Judah, not because you stopped paganism for a season. Calamity will pursue you because you've burned incense, because you've sinned, uh, have not obeyed the voice of the Lord to walk in his law, in his statutes, testimonies, Therefore, this calamity has happened to you as it is this day. You are living out a consequence of rebellion. Finally, you've spoken the truth. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, God of Israel, you and your wives have spoken with your mouth and fulfilled with your hands, saying, we will surely keep our vows that we have made to burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offering. You will surely keep your vows and perform your vows. You've told the truth, finally, for your true motivation and the reason and validated, if you will, uh, the desolation in Jerusalem. God says, do not even speak my name anymore. Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh, all Judah who dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says Yahweh, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God lives. Don't even associate with me. Same consequences as before. Behold, I will watch over them for adversity and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and famine until there is an end to them. However, as always in the Old Testament, there will still be a remnant left. Yet a small number who escape the sword shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. And all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to dwell there shall know whose words will stand. Mine or theirs. They'll know that it's mine. And it's this is the nature of God. The case has been built the warnings have been given. The consequences have been given. Then they rebel again and another consequence is given. And yet God still says, those few who will turn to me, I will still save. This, this is what changed my opinion of uh, the God of the Old Testament. Verses like this, are, they're everywhere. They are throughout. It is so consistent. God does harsh things. God... God judges sin harshly for his people. God allows calamity to come on his people when they turn from him. But always, always, God says, come home, the key is under the mat. And those that return in faith uh, will be invited back in. God gives a sign. And this shall be a sign to you, says the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for adversity. And you will fall. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give King Hophra, this is the sign, the king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies and into the hand of those who seek his life. In the same way I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. So that is the end of that chapter. According to the historian Herodias, Hophra lost his throne in uh, 570 B.C. That is about the time uh, a couple years before Nebuchadnezzar invades in 568. He sent Amasis, one of his generals, to quell a revolt among his army. But the army united behind Amasis and made him Pharaoh. 
Amasis defeated Hophra in battle and imprisoned him. Sometime later, Amasis handed Hophra over to the Egyptians who were clamoring for his death, and they strangled him. And that is the end. Any questions or comments about this chapter?